What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. So, you know, I'm a person that, unlike some young people who refer to older people dismissively as old heads and have this hatred of, of older people, and I don't know what that ageism comes from. It's just, it's, it's a very malignant, acute ageism. Uh, that I see in some young people. They just despise older people. Uh, but anyway, um, I never was like that. You know, I, um, for the most part, I looked at older people who were trying to uh, school me on a lot of things. Don't get me wrong, there's some older people that are just miserable and just like to hate on people. But for the most part, I always listen to older people for wisdom and advice and guidance and um, I say all this because I was always told how great Joe Lewis was growing up you know uh, when I was growing up that was the 80's into the 90's so a lot of people that watched him fight were still alive matter of fact some of the people that were still in sports journalism although toward the ends of their careers they still were active and were talking about Joe Lewis and there was a time when Joe Lewis was as beloved a figure as Michael Jordan as far as uh, I, I would say in this country at least. Now I wouldn't say he was the global figure that Michael Jordan became uh, because of technology constraints, technological constraints. But in the black community, Joe Lewis was even more beloved than Michael Jordan. Even more beloved. Uh, I would argue the only athlete that rivaled his popularity in the black community would be Muhammad Ali. And even with Ali, there was a little bit of a political divide with, with Ali. Joe Lewis was absolutely beloved. Um... But the way this country treated this man was a disgrace, all right? There, there might be some things about him that a few of you guys don't know. First of all, he's not the first black heavyweight champion, uh, or at least recognized heavyweight champion. Uh, I've seen some people make that mistake, a few people. The first black recognized heavyweight champion was, of course, Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson was so goddamn, you know, for this country, unforgivably black <laughs> to uh, the, the white controlling masses in sports at that time. They didn't like his antics. They didn't like that he was brash. They didn't like that he was arrogant. They didn't like that he cavorted with white women. He was everything that they feared. He, put a, he dispelled the myth of white supremacy with his reign and they tried to imprison him for bogus reasons um, you know they, they tried to say that he broke the uh, uh, forgot the law where you're not supposed to be able to transport people across state lines for immoral purposes I forgot that law but you know it's funny it took Donald Trump to posthumously pardon Jack Johnson because Obama was too fucking cowardly to do it you know what I'm saying? But that's another video for another day. But anyway, after Jack Johnson's reign, a black contender would not get another shot at the title for 20 years. 20 years. And it almost didn't happen for Joe Lewis. Jimmy Bradnick, who was a champion at the time, uh, didn't want to fight Joe Lewis because you know the color line hadn't been crossed since uh, who, was it, who was it that Jack Johnson last fought uh, Jess Willard so these were the, the stipulations at least one of the stipulations Jimmy Braddock in a deal with Joe Lewis his manager I believe it was I think his last name I think his name was Blackburn or something like that. I can't remember his name. 
But the deal was that Braddock would get 10% of Joe Lewis's per, uh, purse, purses, I believe it was. I believe he got either, it was either 10% of his purses or 10% of the profits of the fights that Joe Lewis was involved in over the next 10 years. And that's, that's ridiculous. But those were the stipulations. So he was taking money that was supposed to go to Joe Lewis and taking it out of his pocket and giving it to a guy who he beat. Giving him financial security along with whatever other uh, financial endeavors he was involved in. Then there was these unwritten rules that Joe Lewis had to live by when he fought as champion. Number one, he could never be seen as arrogant or gloating. You know, he couldn't do things like stand over his opponent after he knocked him out. He had to be gracious and courteous in every interview. Um, he had to conduct himself in a certain way. He had to basically be a fucking angel. And he could not, or at least try not to, appear to lose his temper. Which had to be difficult when you had journalists, some not knowing uh, that they were subconsciously racist on some level, some openly racist, calling him names, calling him certain uh, undesirable terms. You know, he had some really ugly nicknames back then. Um, the one that stuck, that became politically correct, was the Brown Bomber. But there were some other ones that were horrible. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but you can do some research, Google search, and you'll see what I'm talking about. He had to deal with that. Then uh, uh, there was a, the big, one of the biggest ones, I say, of all. And that is that he could not be seen cavorting with white women. Now, obviously he did, but he had to do it discreetly very discreetly and he couldn't do it uh, in a prolific manner right then one of the biggest disgraces was when he fought a fellow by the name of Max Schmeling now Max Schmeling was a German fellow um, he wasn't a Nazi but Adolf Hitler used him because this was when the Hitler regime was in, 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 you know, in charge in Germany. He used Schmeling as an advertisement of German Aryan supremacy. And one of the things that was most disgusting about when they fought the second time, because they fought the first time, when they fought the first time in early 1936, Joe Lewis was knocked out by Max Schmeling. Schmeling saw a flaw in Joe Lewis's fighting style and took advantage of it. But when they fought the second time, while most of America, most of the 70 million people listening on the radio that night, most of them were cheering for Joe Lewis, most of them. But a disgusting segment, in particular many in the South, were cheering for Max Schmeling. Not only was he not a man from this country, but technically, Considering that in a few years we'd be fighting against fascism, wouldn't you consider that traitorous? That's the second time that many of these people, I'm pretty sure many have waved the Confederate flag in pride, for the second time at least, you could see that uh, a situation where you could call them out for being traitors. But they'll, they'll never look at it like that. Then, you know, look, Joe Lewis did all these exhibitions when World War II broke out. I don't think he got paid for mo most of, if not all of them. He didn't get paid in any of them, I believe. He did them, you know, because, you know, he wanted to be the patriotic guy, right? Uh, but then comes a situation after the war when his career is obviously beginning to wind down. He has an 11-year reign as heavyweight champion. His skills are beginning to diminish. And here comes the IRS. Here comes the IRS. Never mind that Joe Lewis for all those exhibitions for free when he was in the Army. Uh, well, at least not really in the Army, but, you know, uh, touring with the Army, I'll, I'll, I'll say. 
Here comes the IRS coming after this man. And they plagued him for the rest of his life. One of the worst, I think possibly the most disgusting thing that happened to Joe Lewis was sometime in the late 40s, Joe Lewis, the big, the most popular sports figure in the world at that time, not just in America, but in the world, he went to the Ford Foundation because he wanted to own a car dealership and he wanted to be a spokesperson for Ford. Now mind you, we're not talking about 2023 or 2000, we're not even talking about 1977, we're talking about 19, I think it might have been 1948-49. So at the time, Henry Ford had passed away, so his son Henry Ford II was the, the head honcho. He and the top executive branch, the biggest dealers, they wanted nothing to do with Joe Lewis because they were afraid that if they associated themselves with a black man, it would ruin the Ford uh, name. It, he would slander the Ford name. It was, uh, sl I don't want to say slander, but he would disgrace the Ford name because he's black. Oh, I'll root for you in the ring. But business-wise, no, no, you, you, we, we can't be associated with you. We can't sit down at corporate meetings with you. You're black. That was the worst. Then he had other business uh, dealings that he tried to get into that were denied because he was black. So he ceased to be Joe Lewis, the hero fighter, when he tried to be Joe Lewis, the... Uh, when he tried to be Joe Lewis the businessman he failed so he had to come back into boxing with diminished skills ultimately getting knocked out by Rocky Marciano then he went into wrestling because the IRS man was coming and for the rest of his life as you know his athletic abilities declined he put on weight went bald you know he couldn't fighter or do anything athletic anymore then he tried to commentate um, Joe Lewis was a great fighter but he wasn't a great talker I'm not saying he wasn't smart but he just didn't have the he, he just wasn't gifted in being a, a, a analyst or color commentator so that failed he basically lived uh, for the rest of his life on the kindness of his friends and I, you know, and it's funny that I have to say that perhaps the kindest friends that he had were many people associated with the mob. I, I hate to say it, but his country let him down. The so-called government let him down. The so-called good guys let him down. It was the so-called dark underworld. Frank Sinatra and his mob associates. That got him that position at the, uh, I think it was this, I know it was in Las Vegas. I can't remember which uh, casino it was. Maybe it was the Sands, I can't remember. But it was them that got him that position where he essentially just shook hands and, and hobnob and, you know, touted as the former heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. Get, meet Joe Lewis. He greeted people and he was paid for that. And when he became enfeebled, due to heart issues and strokes and things of that nature it was the people that knew Joe Lewis even when he became mentally somewhat demented because of A uh, the damages that boxing had done to him physically neurologically and the fact that the man was probably clinically depressed because the country had let him down. The country that he fought so hard for. That he tried to prove he was such a good guy. Don't judge me by the color of my skin, but by the content of my character. As Dr. King once professed. But even when he did that, it wasn't enough for America. And America treated him terribly. Oh, not impressed. They'll talk about how great a boxer he was. But when it came time for him to sustain himself after boxing. He went from being Joe Lewis, the legend, to just another nigger. 
And that's why, even though I often criticize athletes for acting selfishly, because you're rich and all of that, right? I mean, you know, look, you got fans. Uh, you know, you, you do have a duty as an athlete to perform. But other than that, when it comes to your dollars, do what's best for you. And that's why, in some ways, I have no problems with, with some of the stuff Floyd Mayweather does as he got older. Educate yourself in business and take take advantage of the opportunities that you have now that a Joe Lewis didn't have. That a, a Henry Armstrong didn't have. One of the great fighters of his generation, in my opinion, top three all-time fighter. Multiple champions, simultaneously in different divisions. But this man died destitute and alone in a, I think it was a Los Angeles apartment. So, just want to tell you that, man, I hope this wasn't too depressing. But sometimes life needs to be told. Can't live in fairy tales. And this is what they did to Joe Lewis.